from chemists and biochemists. In this video, what I'd like to talk to you about is calculating the PI of a single amino acid. Now, for my example here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the amino acid lysine. Now, lysine is a proteinogenic amino acid that is that has the three-letter code of L, Y, S, and the single-letter code of K. Now, this amino acid, the way that I always like to draw them, is I like to draw them at a pH of 1. So at a pH of 1, the amino acid lysine is going to look a little bit like this. H3N plus C, C, O, O, H, H. And then my backbone for lysine is going to have a total of three CH2s. Then, or four CH2, sorry. Three, four, and then NH3 plus. Okay. Now, the pKa values for lysine, or, well, the ionizable groups with lysine are the N termini, the C termini, and the R group. The C termini has a pKa of approximately 2.18. The N termini has a pKa of about 8.95. And the R group has a pKa of about 10.53. Okay, so when you look at lysine as it's presented right here, this is a molecule that has a charge of plus two. Okay, now if you were to add base to this and begin titrating, this amino acid with a strong base like sodium hydroxide, what you would ultimately see is the first group to get deprotonated would be this C termini. And that no charge there, that neutral charge of that carboxylic acid would lose that proton and have a negative charge. So that would make your molecule overall have a charge of plus one. And so right at about a pH of, if you said 2.19, if the pH of a uh, solution was 2.19 and had lysine in it. Well, the predominant form would have a charge of plus one. Is there still the plus two form of that molecule in there? Absolutely, but it's the minority group there. Okay, now the next group that you're going to deprotonate actually takes a while to get to, and that's your N termini. The N termini pKa of 8.95 indicates that it's going to be the second group that's deprotonated. Now, whenever that group is deprotonated, what's going to be left behind is, well, your positive charge is going to be gone on that nitrogen, and you're going to be left with, I'm just going to draw two several times over my three there. There we go, like a glove that you barely even notice. NH2, okay, so whenever that positive charge is gone, that group has gone from positive charge to no charge whatsoever. So then you're left with zero, negative, and you still have that positive charge. So that ultimately has a charge of zero. Okay, the, the third and final group that's going to be deprotonated is your side chain. That side chain will be deprotonated or will be um, the mostly deprotonated. So the predominant form will be deprotonated when your pH is above that pKa of 10.53. Scribble that off. There we go, NH2. Okay, so whenever that group is deprotonated. So when all three groups have been deprotonated, this molecule is going to have a charge of minus one. So this group or this molecule could never have a charge of plus three. It could likewise never have a charge of minus two. At a neutral pH, the most common form is probably going to be plus one or zero. Um, but to determine that, what we need to do is figure out our PI. Okay, now I like to draw my molecule of a charge of uh, at a pH of one, and then I like to show this sort of spectrum of my charges. And each one of these arrows indicates kind of a transition period where I've gone from the predominant form being plus one to the predominant form being, or sorry, the predominant form being plus two to the predominant form being plus one. And that's going to take place when my pH is equal to my first pKa, which is 2.18. Okay. So I like to basically write my pKa values at each one of these kind of junctions, because 
If my pH is equal to 8.95, then 50% of my molecule has a plus one charge, 50% of my molecule has a zero charge. So then my last pKa to write is 10.53, which indicates my transition from the zero to the negative one form. Okay, so when I'm calculating my pI, whether I'm doing an amino acid or a polypeptide, what I've done is I've mapped out my possible charges, then I point out and figure out the ones that I actually care about. The only pKa values are the ones that flank the zero to plus one and zero to minus one charge transition. So what that means is to calculate my pI, all that I'll do is I'll say 8.95 plus 10.53 divided by two. Okay, so I've got my calculator before me. I'm gonna open it up. 8.95 plus 10.53 equals 19.48, divide that by two, and I end up with a PI of 9.74, okay? Now, that number is significant. The PI, the isoelectric point, is significant because that's the, the pH at which your molecule is going to be the least soluble. That's also going to be the point where your molecule has an overall charge of zero. Okay, so that's all that you need to do in order to calculate the PI of an amino acid. Figure out where your molecule transitions, at what pKa's your molecule transitions from a plus one to zero and a zero to a minus one. If you're dealing with a diprotic amino acid, like isoleucine, valine, tryptophan, how many pKa's do you have? Two. So your PI calculation is pretty simple and straightforward with those two. When you're dealing with your triprotic, amino acids, you have to come up with something like this and uh, basically a strategy. So with that said, I hope this was helpful. I hope you have a better understanding of how to calculate the PI of a single amino acid. All right, well, have a good one.